Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we said we'll start directly with Helchus uh, Pesach, not even do our fila discussion or fila learning because uh, we don't have much time. We just have today, and then we're off till after Pesach. So <clears throat> we'll start with uh, Pesach immediately. If there are any questions, gladly we can uh, try to take it. Take them and answer them. If we don't know the answer, I'll send by email uh, to everyone. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm using uh, Shlomo Zalman uh, Halacha, written in a book called Shalmei Moed, which is a student of his, Rabbi Freind, who put out a compilation of all the Chagim, uh, according to Shlomo Zalman, the halachos uh, that he wrote in various different books and articles. Uh, so he compiled it into one book here about the Chagim. <coughs> so we'll start uh, with Bdika Tchameitz. Uh, the Bdika we do, we check our house, we see that everything is clean. Uh, the night of the eve of Pesach. Uh, this year it's going to be Thursday, Thursday night, uh, since Leila Seder is on Shabbat. So Thursday night we bedikat chametz. Um, it's a little bit uh, unsure what exactly we're checking for. Uh, in our days, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, uh, women are very uh, uh, strong about cleaning for Pesach, and not only for Pesach; it's spring cleaning altogether, mainly for dust and other stuff. But uh, it includes chametz. So the house is speckless clean. So what exactly are we doing when we're checking the house? Uh, right, so the, all the equipment is better and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the detergents are stronger. It seems much, much stronger than it used to be then. Uh, and we're, in, in general, uh, our life is cleaner than it used to be back then. So, uh, and then besides that, besides that, we also do bitul chametz, meaning we cancel any of the chametz that may be left over. We announce, we declare that it's all like dust, ke'afra de'ara, or hefker. It, we don't own it. So we do bitul chametz for anything that may be left over somewhere. We do mechiras chametz. We sell any chametz we may have in the house. And sometimes we deliberately leave chametz in the house in or, and sell it, but that's not uh, recommendable if it's, if it's chametz gamur. Best that if it's, if it's uh, packages of pasta or cookies or crackers, get rid of them before Pesach. Uh, either finish them up or uh, there are places up here in Shul, they also have a box where you can throw a dump it in the box and they take it uh, for the needy. Families, they sell that. That's okay because it's hefsin meruba. The moment it's a large amount of chametz gomer, you can sell it. And then they give it to the needy after Pesach, after it was sold, so it's not chametz shavala of Pesach. So, but we do sell anything that may have chametz in, combined in it, like uh, non kosher of Pesach uh, um, foods, mixtures of food, tarobet chametz may be in there that we're not aware of. So we sell that. Uh, we don't use it on Pesach, of course, if it doesn't say Kashul on Pesach. So we don't use it, and we sell. Uh, what? <laughs> Sometimes you can't even use it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because of Kitniot. Right. Um, and we'll soon speak about Kitniot specifically. So we sell. We do B-tool. What's left to check? And we clean the house, speckless clean. So what are we doing? What's the reason to check? So, first of all, it, it's what Chazah instructed us to check for the Chamitz. Uh, Rabbi Shlomo Zaman really uh, decided uh, to uh, take into consideration the fact that the house was cleaned up very well before, before Pesach and said the following. You can go around with the candle. Uh, we'll soon speak about using... Uh, flashlight and other things of that sort, but we should use a candle. That's again, Chazal instruct us 
uh, based on a, a whole series of psukim that uh, in the Gemara they, they, they relate to as uh, what, what does it mean to inspect, to check. That's the final pasuk that the Gemara learns from, that it's with candle. So you go with the candle with the family members that cleaned out each room. You take your kids with you that uh, did this room and that room, each one did their own. Hopefully, they helped you with the cleaning so they know where they've done, what they've done. And then all you need to do as you're doing the bdika is ask each child, did you do this closet? Did you do this drawer? Did you do this uh, knapsack? Did you do this, uh, uh, your bed or underneath or anything of that sort? And if they say, yes, I did, then you can rely and not even open the drawer. Um, and then, then above, yeah, then over our mitzvah. During the bdika? Um, during the bdika, yes. We are allowed to talk as, if it has to do with the bdika, correct. And it has to do with the bdika, we're allowed to talk. We shouldn't, one shouldn't talk about anything else, but, but about the bdika issues, yes. Um, interesting, can we rely on a child less than bar mitzvah? Um, I'll tell you what, the Gemara says in Ketubot 28a, the Gemara there says that any uh, uh, proof that's needed from a person, that, like, like an ed, a witness, about rabbinic, Rabbinic matters, a katan is reliable. Rabbinic matters, yes, not the writer level. There's a whole Mishnah there. If you bought Kafchet and Mudal, there's a whole Mishnah that shows different examples of when a katan is reliable, when not. And the common denominator of when yes is when it's Rabbanon, the Rabbanon only. Um, Dikas Chameitz is. Uh, because of the bitul, it's interesting, because of the fact that we do bitul chametz, so really have taken care of the right level of balei balei matzeh. We can never do... Oh, that's what I'm saying. Only because, had it been, had the chametz been, been, been uh, uh, not nullified, not canceled by bitul, then it would have been the right you would need to get rid of every single piece of chametz midoraita, so you should have balei balei matzeh. And to get rid of it, you have to check for it, look for it, inspect the house. So that would have been deraita. But since we do the B tool, so it's no longer deraita. No matter what, we'd canceled all the chametz. Just why do we do the bdika? So Chazal say, Shema lo bitlo belev shalem. Maybe. You said the words, you declared, but it's, you don't really believe in it because if you find a, a wafer, a, 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 a bag of beastly or something, that's not dust really. You said it's dust, but it's not really dust. So although we, we should really believe so because we don't want to be over and bali bali matze, but it depends in your heart what you really feel about it. So as our concern, the people may not feel that it's really dust or really have care, Depending on Rashi or Tosfos, what is what is bitul chametz? Making it like dust, or doing, or making it not yours? We do both. In the bitul, we do we say both. So since we're not sure and not certain, you did it with all your heart and you, all your intent, and you really mean it. So we do bdika in order to find it. After all, if there is anything left over somewhere, we find it, and then we either get rid of it by biur chametz, we burn all the chametz that we find. Or we sell it. So we're going, but we said best, best not to sell Hamid's Gomor unless it's Hefzim Merube. Because we're not so sure how to sell to a guy products that he doesn't take actually to his house. Not simple to find halachically the uh, process of how we acquire something that remains in your house. That's a difficulty about selling Hamid's in our days. By the way, it used to be when they first invented, uh, in the, when the Gemara discusses Mechiras Hametz, they talk about actually moving it into, his, into the Goy's home. We used to give it over to him, and he used to keep it all through Pesach and buy, acquire it, that it would be his. And after Pesach, either he gave it back to you, or if he ate it up, then he needs to pay you for every single package you gave him. He acquires by 
Kinan uh, Chatzer, it's in his place, or Kinan Kesser by giving you a little bit of the money that it's worth. But if he actually consumed it, he needs to pay you the entire amount. Like anyone who buys something, he pays for the product, full price. Of course, it can't be done today. No, of course, of course. <laughs> Just take the super salad and all that. They have tons and tons of chavit. So they sell it. So since it's Hefzin Merube, we rely on a sale, even though the guy doesn't take it to his uh, possession, uh, to his location. Okay, so that's how we do the Bdika in our days. It's enough to ask. So I'm saying uh, a good question if, if, a, if a child okay. below 13 or 12 is reliable to say that they cleaned cleaned well. Uh, I would say that if, since it's rabbinic, because you did, you're going to do bit to anyhow. So you're just left with maybe you didn't do it with, with your full heart and really uh, really uh, uh, accept it and agree with it. So it's only rabbinic now that we need to do the bdika. It becomes only rabbinic because of this shema. Shema lo shalem. So by rabbinic uh, issues, we do rely on a katan. Uh, but you have to make sure that it's a kid that knows what he's doing, that, that can be reliable. What's that? Yeah, but then it's a, it, it, takes, it can take you a very long time. You have to open every single drawer, every single closet, and search. Not just open, close. You have to start moving around everything, and every drawer, every closet, every table, every knapsack, everything. You have to open it all up, and imagine pockets. Just look at the pockets of all the clothes. You have to empty out each pocket to make sure there's nothing there. So we're talking about a very long. They say, by the way, speaking of Rebchaim Kanievsky, they say it took him six hours for Bdikat Hametz in two and a half rooms. In two and a half rooms, six hours. So imagine if they do our house, our homes, how long it should really take us. If we don't use Rav Shlomo Zaman's technique, then... <laughs> right. <laughs> and then he was ever ready for Tikin to make a seal on the entire Torah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So I'll just repeat the question for the Zoom ladies. Um, Sarah is asking what happens if you're going to be during Pesach in two different locations? And only in one of them will you be at the night of Digas Chametz. What do you do with the other place that you're going to be at during Pesach? Uh, well, how do you do the Bdika there? So first of all, if you're able to get to the second place, even by driving over, it's in uh, close proximity, you can drive even from city to city. Then you need to do Bdika that same night for both places. So you, have, you have an office. Let's say you have an office in Tel Aviv. Then Ranana, you do your house first in Ranana, and then you drive to your office and do the office. If you're That's in the office correct. You or any or any other work. No, but you might also do it. No, wait, wait, wait. That's something else. That's something else. If you're not going to be. This is very important. If you're not going to be in a certain house or certain office during the entire Pesach, you don't need Bdika at all. Because what you do is you sell the entire place. You're not going to be there. The whole point of doing Bdika is, as we said, ah, we, the two points here. First of all, we said, shalem. You may not have done the Bito with all your heart, with all your intent, with all your Kavana. You don't really mean it. Wait, wait, I'll get to... Okay, let's... No, there's also a difference if you're leaving your gimel. Right. Anytime we're leaving within 30 days, we're getting, let, we're getting caught on to many, many questions. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it, let's do it so slowly, slowly but surely, so we get everything right. Um, if, again, if you're, if you're not planning on being in a certain place during the entire past, no one is going to be there. No Jewish person is going to enter that home or office the entire seven days of Pesach, or eight days because it's Shabbat this year. We, have, uh, we also have eight days in Israel. Um, so if you're not planning on being there at all, you don't need to do Bdika at all in that place. 
Because all you do is you sell the, all the chametz that's there. The whole problem of after selling and after bitul, what's left to check? That's what we asked before. So we said, maybe you didn't do it with full intent, the bitul. You don't really mean it. And then it's yours. You have to make sure it's not there. And what about the mechira? So we said, best not to sell complete chametz. <coughs> But you may have left over something that you didn't notice. That's real chamit. But still you sold it. In the end, you sold it. So what's wrong? Why do we still need to do bdika? So the next point is, say chazal, the next con- uh, concern is, shema imtza bruska yefeifia v'yochlena. Meaning, during Pesach, you're at home, you may find a chamit product. It looks to you so delicious. Bruska yefeifia beautiful, uh, delicious-looking cookie, and you'll eat it by mistake. Eating it doesn't help that you sold it to a guy, doesn't help that you did beetle, doesn't help that you did beer, doesn't help anything. If you eat chame, it's, it's an issue of the rice. Why were Chazal so concerned that that may happen? After all, it's Pesach. You're not we're so scared of seeing chame and having any crumb of chame in our house. How will we eat it? So the answer is, because you're so used to eating chame all year round, so when you just suddenly fall upon a cookie and it looks so delicious, or a bag of uh, beastly, looks so delicious, you may forget for a second that it's basically because you're so common to eat chametz all year round. That's, that's why Chazal were extra concerned that you may eat it. Uh, and truth of the matter is, I'll just say one more point about all this. The truth of the matter is that it seems like the Raita and Midera Banan were chasing after every crumb, every piece, anything that can ever be in our home. And we're dealing with it with so many way, in so many ways. It looks like we're going to war. We're going to war against this chametz. That's what it looks like. And besides all that, don't forget that it's the only halacha, only situation in the entire halacha that batel afilu b'mi'ut kolshu. Let's say you, you cooked up a huge pot of soup or chillant or meat or whatever, maybe a huge pot. And one crumb, crumb of chametz fell in, the entire pot, the entire food has to be thrown in the garbage. We don't have that by any, any, anything. Pork can fall into to, to soup and you can eat it if it's batal bashish. If it's time 60 and you don't see it. It's not visible and it's less than the amount is, of the of the permissible food is more than 60 times the amount of the non-kosher food that fell in, you're allowed to eat the whole thing. Oh, so what's the lesson? Says the Radbaz, the Radbaz was one of the late we shown him. He says he searched for all kinds of reasons halachically to explain this, and he couldn't find. He couldn't find any halachic logical reason for this. The only thing he said was that Khamets resembles the Sahara. Mara says that there are two things that are preventing the final gilula to come. Seol Shebaisa, not related to Pesach at all. This is the Gemara, I believe, Perik Chalik and Sanhedrin, nothing to do with uh, Pesach, but it says there that there are two things that are preventing the gilula from coming. Seol Shebaisa, which is the Yetzirah, that we're still involved in all kinds of sins or wrongdoings, and Shiabud Malchuyot. The fact that the Goyim are in control of us, we're in exile for sure, but even in, in our state, we're still not a free people totally to decide what we really uh, believe in. And sometimes the Shiabud Malchuyot is that they, they're so controlling that our minds don't work as original Jewish minds. They're controlled by the philosophy and uh, culture of the going. That's, uh, that's preventing the Gula. So we see here that the phrase, the word that Chazal used to describe the Yetzihara is Se'o Shebaisa. And so is what makes it rise. So that's Chametz. So it says the Baz, we learn from here that Chametz resembles the Yetzihara, and Matzah is when we're completely free of Yetzihara. That's the Cherut of Pesach. We completely, uh, with Hashem, believing in Hashem and completely 
following his ways, that's real liberty. Uh, to accept upon ourselves shiabud of Hashem instead of shiabud, instead of to, to be enslaved to human beings and to uh, wrong <coughs> doings or wrong thoughts. So says the Baz, since Hametz resembles Yitzhahara, we want to chase after Yitzhahara totally. We don't want a drop of Yitzhahara in us. We want to be completely Yitzhahara. That's the only reason you could find. It's like a spiritual reason, philosophical reason within Halacha. That's why we do all these things, Ika, Bitul, Biur, Mechira, everything we can to make sure nothing is left and we don't do any mistake during past. That's the main concept without getting into detail. Now, what Sarah asked before, going back to that. So if you're not planning on entering a certain home or office during the entire Pesach, you don't need, you do the B tool, B tool, you cancel all the chametz that's in there. But mainly, since it could be actual chametz, you do mechira. So, and then we do B tool and mechira. And hopefully, again, you don't leave over uh, cheap real chametz, because we said that's not good to leave over in any case, even if you're not going to be in the house <laughs> all seven days or eight days uh, uh, at all, we still own it. And lo yirei lecha chametz, lo yimatze lecha seo, that's something that you're not allowed to own. Doesn't matter if you see it, if you're in touch with it, if you encounter it, doesn't matter, you're not allowed to own it. So we don't, we try not to sell chametz gomer that's not expensive, only if it's very expensive, like a bottle of whiskey that could cost uh, several hundred shkalim. But otherwise, we prefer not to hold on to any uh, real actual chametz. But we do a mechira over anything that may be in the house. And since we're not entering the house for seven days, so there's no concern that you may fall upon because they're not going to be there. So there's no concern that you may fall upon a, a chametz that looks delicious and eat it by mistake. So therefore, it's enough Without, without a decay. If you are planning on going to and coming to a certain home mid Pesach, then you need to do bdika in that place because from the from the time of from the proper time of bdika chametz of uh, of Leil Yudalid, of Thursday evening this year, you need to do bdika in the proper time. True that if you're leaving a home before this night before the night of bdika chametz, leaving the house and you'll return to it mid-Pesach, or even if you won't, well, even if you won't. Right. What? Oh, we'll get to doing it in Pesach, within Pesach. But first, we're supposed to try to take care of all our places before Pesach comes in, before Pesach enters. So if you're leaving the house or unable to get to a certain location the night of Dikas Chameis, and you do it, night before, two nights before, three nights before, any time within 30 days, within 30 days of the Gat Chamei. No bracha. No bracha. The only night that you can say a bracha for before the time, meaning you can never say the bracha before it's time, only the night of the Gat Chamei, it's only then you do with the bracha. Any other bdika that you do before the time because you're not going to be around for that evening of the Gat Chamei, so you do without a bracha. Oh, so that was the second option. So firstly, we said, best if you can get there, if it's possible. And by the way, you have to get there after saying the bracha in your own home and checking it. Then you drive over to the place where you need to do the second bdika without talking. Because if you talk on the way, then again, you cancel the bracha that is supposed to include both locations. If you do talk about something that is not related to bdika tchamet, then you've canceled hesach that, you've canceled the bracha there. And then you need to say the second bracha, the second place. It's not terrible, but it's best if you don't talk and you don't do extra brachas by interrupting. So uh, you keep quiet for a while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, you can listen to the radio or something, but uh, you can't talk. No. Oh, so that's the second option. That's the second option. First of all, mitzvah bo, bishlucho. Anything we do on our own is better than having a shadiyah do it for us. But if we, but if it's very, ah, wait, so that's another point. If you're having, let's say, 
let's say you have a big home or you have two homes like this, two homes or a home in an office, and you're trying to do in both places. Then what you could do is, what you could do is, it's still considered your shalia. It's not considered yourself, but it's a little stronger to do it this way. You have all the people that are going to help you check your home or other homes by you when you say the bracha, and then they listen, shomea <laughs> ke'one. <laughs> yeah, for the amount of offices. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right, if you don't go in, well, you may go in for Cholomoyed. Uh, you may go there. You're not. Okay. You <laughs> shall That's where we should be. <laughs> Anyhow, so if we're. Uh, so we should have the people around us to check, to, to listen to the bracha as we're saying the bracha, and then they, they disperse to do all the locations to help us out. It's still considered shaliach, but at least uh, it's based on your bracha. One bracha is made for all, and then they do the bracha in various okay, different but locations. You know, but then that's the same issue. Someone has to go there, start in the same place, and do it like right. the same night. Right, then he's stuck with the same situation, right? So if they do it in a different place, it's still considered a shaliach, unless they own the place. If they own the place, he does. He does. A shaliach that does a mitzvah, he's the one to say the bracha, not the owner. When the shaliach does the mitzvah, he does the bracha. Exactly. Exactly. Ideally, best that you do both, but if you can't, then the shaliach does it for you. You call someone like, Hey, man, if he has a, a, a apartment in Shalim, if, he, if they would have used it during Pesach, they could have had a neighbor go into their apartment there and do the B'dika there. Yes, after Mari, because it's uh, after Shkia, after Tzais. No, I'm trying to figure out to do it at home, like inside. Right. Mm-hmm. You're late, yeah, Sorry, but uh, say so yeah, I take less than six hours total. So, <laughs> so you're doing better than a Yeah, <laughs> yeah but... Uh, Right. And then you're renting somewhere that someone knows control over. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning at, at Udalid evening, Eve of Udalid, you don't have any control. It's not yours. You're only going to be renting it. Okay, that's a great question. So that's like hotels. You're going to go to a hotel during Pesach or even or even before the day after. You're going to go to the hotel the day after, and you'll be in the hotel for Pesach. Then what? The answer is. As of Yudalit Eve, and all the way through Pesach, including Pesach itself, any place we go to, <clears throat> to live in, not to stay for, to be for a meal, not going, everybody go to a meal to someone and you start doing Dika in their home <laughs> before you go into the house. <laughs> yeah, you don't do that, but if you're, <laughs> because it's not yours then, but if you're, renting a place or in a hotel room, which is considered yours for the time being, it's Chobat Hadar. It's the one that, that has the key, that's in charge, that, that, that has the um, semi-ownership. He controls. He controls the house or the room those days of Pesach. Then they have, you have to do a B'dika, even mid-Pesach, with a brach. After the time, before we said that if you do a B'dika before you daled, as of 30 days before that, up until you dalet, you do a b'dika without a brach. Like a bochri yeshiva, or a girl from a seminary, who leave around Aleph Nisan, Bet Nisan, they have been azmanim. So the night before they leave, they do b'dika in their room without a brach. So, so that's, uh, again, we could, they could also sell the entire room if they're not going to go there during Pesach. But sometimes the people visit during Pesach, even in the yeshiva, uh, to learn something or to, or, or, or to get stuff from the room. So it's best to do a before they leave without a bracha. What's that? Also, even, that's even, that's even more necessary. Right, 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 right. Exactly, that's even more necessary to do a right? People are going to be there. So, <coughs> but after you dalid, as if you dalid day, all through Pesach, anytime you, if you do a because you're, you come into a new location which you weren't there before, and it's now 
considered yours because you're in control of it, you have to do a bdika with a bracha. <coughs> unless, unless someone had been there the night of bdika's chametz or the day or two after, before you, and did bdika in the place. If someone was there and did bdika, then you don't need to do another bdika. Then you burn it immediately. If you burn it immediately, if it's Yom Tov, the Gemara says, Kofe alav et akli. It's Yom Tov, you, uh, you put a bowl over it or something to make sure you don't touch it. Again, don't forget, this is after you did Bitul and Mechira and everything. So it's just that you don't, by mistake, eat it. So you, put a, you cover it with a bowl or something until, let's say, Yom Tov, and then you burn it. Um, there's also a possibility if you don't have where to burn chametz during Pesach, you're in a hotel room where you're going to burn the chametz now. So you can dump it, throw it into the toilet. Flush it down the toilet. Another way to do it. Uh, but immediately, you can't put it in your pocket half a day and then get to the toilet and then go burn it. Take it from the second you found it and run to the toilet, flush it down, and then you're fine. So it doesn't matter if it's a roll, a loaf of bread, everything. I mean, you have to break it to small pieces if you want to flush it down. But it doesn't matter if it looks like an excellent food in Chavetz. It's not considered disgraceful to, to bread to flush it down the toilet. That's during Pesach, that's what you do. You get rid of it totally. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Back on the yeah. Um, because it's your family like, member. Not really, because it's meant to be the person who's in control of the house. He's the one that's supposed to do the bdika. Well, so, no, but I've <laughs> What's that? Ah, no, so that's, that's something else. Anyone renting is considered the one in control, not the owner. Not the owner. The one that's using the apartment is the one that's considered in control. So no, so then it's different. No, then it's definitely on their, uh, it's, it's their mitzvah. Even if you pay their bills, I'll tell you what, what, what proves control. If you can just open the door and go in. As a parent paying the bills, can you just open the door and go in? Probably not. What? what? I don't. It's an unmarried uh-huh. <laughs> no, but let's say that's on an example. Can you rearrange everything there? Yes, everything you can do. <laughs> I think your children won't, won't, won't be happy if you do that to them. I think it's mainly theirs. They're, they're, they're using. It's, it's, it's their use. So by Nikas Chometz, you go by use. Same as mezuzah, by the way. Hobat Hadar. Mezuzah is, is, is an obligation of the owner of the apartment, rather the person who's using it. But using with some, by, by mezuzah, there is a need for some ownership like renting. If they rent it, they own it a little bit. By just uh, being there without any ownership, then the, the mezuzah is the obligation of the owner. Like if people who work in offices or doctors in, in hospitals, they get, they get a room. That room, they don't own at all. They use it. And uh, uh, no, no one can touch their stuff in the room, but they're only using it, not even renting it only using it, it's completely not theirs. If the boss wants to switch them from room to room, he can do it in a second. Say, please leave this room and go to that room. So the mezuzah is on the owner and not on the worker in that case. But if it's a rental, so the mezuzah obligation is on the renter and, and not on the owner. No, then you would need a bracha. The next morning, you would need a bracha. If it's after, so is that yes, okay? I said any time so after the time to, checking. No, 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 no. If you do a second bracha, it doesn't help not to talk because it's too much so of an interval. Like, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. like, yeah. You could, but the better time of the comments is, is the night. Well, no, but better no, if better people who live. You're talking about a person who, no, ah, I thought they're living there, no, and that's their look. Ah, okay, okay. 
Right, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's definitely the better timing, but if it's very, very, very inconvenient, but or shaliach, a shaliach is fine. Um, yeah, it would be better. Yes, yes. Because the main time the Chazal instructed us with Dika is late air, the Yudalit. eve of Yudalit. That's when they instructed us with Dika. If it's, is not even right. Right, it's considered uh, still a Chathila fine. Yes. As long as the, the house was checked. Friday becomes already drop less because it's not the time the Chazan instructed us to do the deal. Oh, in the hotel, the hotel, it depends. If you know, if let's say you can find out who was the, who, who, who was the guest in the same room that you get the night of the eve of Yudalid, if you can find out. Usually they don't tell you because it's like uh, confidential, it's private. Is no one there? It could be that someone's there and leaves in the morning, no? Yeah, you know, All right, hotels for sure they're there the day before. Yeah, okay. But in, in Israel, you come Friday noon, Friday afternoon to the hotel room. So if there was someone there and you can find out who it was and you can ask him they did Dika, then you don't need to do Dika at all. It was done already. By the way, you can't rely on the fact that they clean the room. That's not enough. That's how the same as we clean our homes and we still do Dika. That's not enough because they're not checking for comments. They're cleaning it generally. Oh, so I'm saying it depends. If there was no guest there on the eve of Yudalit, there wasn't a guest in that room, or uh, you're sure they did not do Abdika because they tell you it was a goy, or they tell you it was a now only the true, they didn't do Abdika there, then you do Abdika with the brach because you know it wasn't checked. Even if you come in Friday day or if you come in mid Pesa, come in mid Pesa to hotel room, if you know for sure that there was no Abdika done with the brach, if you're not certain, now if you know for sure that there was Abdika done, but you also have to know that the people never brought in chametz after the Bika was done, so it's complicated. But if, you, if you're not sure if there was, or if you know there was, and you're not sure if the people brought in chametz or not, then you do a Bika without a bracha. Uncertain, do a Bika without a bracha. But then you have to know that not only was a Bika done, but no one brought in chametz after the Bika. Let's say if the, if the cleaners uh, ate a sandwich as they're cleaning the, the, the room after the Bika was done, then the Bika is canceled. Okay, but even so, it's private people. Who knows that they put something in their pockets and walking around and eating something? We can't. Okay, if no, so again, if they tell you the Dika was done, they tell you someone did Dika during for that room and. Yeah. You know, I know. Yeah, you can't tell. I I would do. I would. Let's say you know that you know the machine and he said they did Right. And you know no one's in the room. No, then you don't eat. Then you don't eat. That's it. That's muhzak. That's right. It's not the ownership. It's the fact that the place was checked. You don't need to own it before. The place was checked. That's fine. But you have to know for sure that it was checked. And then no one then entered the room with chametz afterwards. So if you don't know all of that, I would do abdika without a bracha. Without a bracha for sure, because, because it could have been checked and no chametz was there. Okay, one last point of Dika. I want to go on to uh, other points. Yeah, it was the day before. Um, one last point of Dika. Um, uh, any place that's dangerous to use a candle, you can use a flashlight. Better not, because again, we said, there's something specific about, about the old time flame and, 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 and small candle. That should be the way we do Dika. But if we, if it's, let's say in the car, in the car, we definitely have to do a real serious plika. 
there is so much chametz all, all, uh, all, all year long. Serious? I've never seen such a car in the world. And you never have kids. You never have kids in the car. You never have. You never take a person tramp and they they eating something. Nothing. So if you know, it's for sure, for sure. <laughs> okay, if you know for sure no chametz entered the place, then it's cheskat baduk. That's in the house also. If in your home, you know for sure that, let's say, the second floor of the house, never, ever is anyone allowed up with, with food, you don't need to do a bdika there. Grandchildren? <laughs> Right. So as of now, you'll have to definitely do Bdika now because grandchildren are very, I guess, like, <coughs> your diet. That's your diet. Okay, but that's the whole week. Okay, anyhow, so any dangerous place, we use a flashlight, that's for sure. Uh, if sometimes you need to crawl under uh, under closets and things, and it's hard to see with the candle, you do the flashlight. So it's always to help you out. You use a flashlight. Okay. Now let's go on um, to uh, actual. No, we'll do like this. We'll deal with a little bit of uh, um, and involved products that are inedible. Okay, to see how we deal with that. For example, uh, all, this, all types of shampoos and soaps and, uh, uh, and makeup and uh, uh, medicines, all these types of things that may include chametz ingredients in them, but they're inedible. And not only inedible to human beings, basula achilat kelev. There's not a dog that can, no, no animal can, can consume such, such products. So <coughs> the general halachic uh, 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 rule for this type of situation is that if before Pesach came in, or, or more specifically before the sixth hour of the of Yudalit, before that, it was already pasul achilat kel, it was already inedible to any creature in the world, then it's not chametz at all. It's not chametz at all. We can gain hana. We can we can we can benefit from it. Totally fine. So all the makeup and shampoos and soaps and all those, they're completely inedible. Some say that uh, uh, alcoholic uh, uh, sprays and liquids like uh, uh, perfumes, deodorant, sometimes some. Crazy people uh, in certain countries that, that, that are alcoholics, very severe, heavy alcoholics, they would even drink that. <laughs> they would a bottle of perfume because of the alcohol uh, uh, additive in there. Are you serious? The people that would do that? Wow. Alcoholic will look for everything. So those you had to be a little bit more careful about that they should be kashula pesach. If it's a big uh, expense, and you want to throw it away before Pesach, so include it in the Mechira, because it's barely, barely considered chametz, because it's really an edible uh, majority of the people in the world, but don't use them on Pesach, because after all, they, if, if it's not kosher le Pesach, it doesn't sound kosher le Pesach. Now, um, the, only, the only issue that can still uh, be relevant in these cases is when you eat such type of, of things, which is mainly... Uh, swallowing uh, medicines or uh, syrups, syrups, uh, me- medical syrups. So <clears throat> why is that a problem? If after all it's inedible, you're just swallowing, so it should not, still not be a problem. It's not chametz. You're swallowing a uh, cardboard. You're swallowing uh, something that's, that's, that's not chametz. The answer is we have a concept called achshave. The moment you eat something that's even considered inedible, generally, but you decide to eat it anyhow. So you're giving it importance as if it were food. That's called achshave. You're giving it the level of food for you because you decided to eat it. 
even though majority of people in the world wouldn't touch this. But that's only true, and, that, and therefore, uh, you mustn't use them, you mustn't uh, consume and eat such a product, even though it's not, it's inedible to human beings and to animals and to anything. But the question is, is swallowing a pill considered eating? Does that give it the importance of food because you're consuming, because you're swallowing it down, it comes into your body? So by this is a whole dispute amongst the post scheme. Some say that it depends if the medicinal uh, ingredient is the chametz or the chametz is only combined in the medicine, but it's not the medicinal uh, actual uh, uh, part of the, of, of, the, of the pill of the medicine. But Rosh Hashanah was very lenient about this. He held that even if it includes chametz as the medicinal part of the pill, it's not considered at all a problem, including the fact that you're swallowing it, because although swallowing food, if it's actual food that you can chew on and swallow, and people eat it generally, swallowing is like eating. So if let's say you swallow down a small piece of cucumber, you still have to say a bracha, it's considered eating. And if you swallow it down on your kipper, you've eaten on your kipper. Swallowing is considered eating. But he says that's only true for a type of food that you can chew. You're able to chew. And you decide, instead of chewing, you'll gulp it down or swallow it down without chewing. That's considered eating because it's food that came into your body. But if you can't chew it, it can only be swallowed down. It's inedible by, for chewing. It can only be swallowed down. That's not considered eating. And it's completely... Uh, not achshavei and not chametz at all. What's that? No, because that's that's the way you eat. That's the way you eat a drink. You eat drink. That's the way you take it. Right. No, because salads salads have to be chewable in order to be considered eating. When you, even if you just swallow them down, because that's the normal way of eating salad, like chewing. If it's unchewable. Can't chew a pill. Disgusting, bitter, terrible. So that's not food. And if it's not food, then it doesn't matter that you swallow it down. It's not called achshave. You're not considering it as a food. It's considered medicine. Not well, considered why eating. Is it, why isn't it taken like right. And we're not sure about the bracha there. That's why he said bracha on karpas in order to solve the no, bracha. Ah, yes, 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 right. That, uh, <coughs> yeah, but then, that could, you're right about that, but that could be only in consideration about bracha. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not considered achshave from that point of view of chametz. Again, chametz is so stringent that we try to get away from anything we can. So according to Shlomo Zamin, unless it's tasty, if you have pills that are tasty that you can suck on, like cough, Cough medicine, you can sometimes uh, uh, suck, on, suck on them and it's tasty. And cough drops. Or, uh, or the uh, acamole and, and, and types of syrups that kids have for fever or for, for pain. So they're tasty. It's tam perot, it's tam tooth, it's tam this, tam that. So tasty stuff definitely needs kashrus lepesa. It has to be totally kosher lepesa. No chametz involved whatsoever. But uh, if it's something you just swallow down, you don't need any hechshel pesa according to Shlomo Zaman. All those lists and lists of the badats and rabbanut that come out every year with which pills include chametz, which don't, this, 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 that doesn't matter. Unless they have that good taste to them and then you need to have hechshel pesa. Okay. Um, about uh, 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 kitniot, Ah, one more thing, one more thing. Toothpaste. Toothpaste is something we really don't eat. We don't consume. We don't, we hope not to swallow it down. But it has that mint flavor to it. And sometimes it gets swallowed down, even though we don't really want to, but it's, we swallow it as we're brushing our teeth and, and, and rinsing our mouth. Some of it creeps down into our body. So best if toothpaste and uh, uh, mouthwash 
should have kashal pesach on it. That yes, because that's sometimes eaten. And although we're not really intending to, on, on, on eating it, and we're not intending on drinking it, but it happens, so best if you, and it has some type of good taste to it, like the mint taste, so best if that has kashus to Pesach. That's one of the rare things that we need to have. All the rest, like we said, uh, and one more thing is, could be also important to have kashus to Pesach is lipstick. Is lipstick, but when you apply it on your lips and you eat, then it sometimes rubs off onto the food, and you're swallowing it. So although it's definitely not something you chew on and you eat and you enjoy, so there's really not a problem because it's like, ah, no. So I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. What's Kasha La Pesach? Wow. Very nice. But just the lipstick needs to. All the rest of your pioneer face doesn't need. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, great, great. That's also a big, big, big chumrah because you're not really even giving it achshave. You're not even treating it as if you're, you're, you're enjoying, you, you enjoy to eat it. It just gets rubbed off on the food. You have no idea. You have no intent. You don't really mean to give it importance. But since it goes down your body, best if you do have if you can't find, or if you're stuck without, and you need to use lipstick, then you can use the one that's all year round. Nothing will happen there. Okay. Um, keep me out. Uh, one more point. Uh, one more discussion. Keep me out. What's that? <laughs> allowing what? Uh, keep me out. No, <laughs> we're not going to allow keep me out. Uh, I guess till Mashiach comes. Uh, <coughs> but. Uh, <coughs> There's one stringency and one uh, leniency, but I want to say in general back here. <laughs> okay, so I'll start the leniency. The leniency we've spoken about, I think, uh, years already, is the derivatives of kitniot that are inedible as a kitnia, as a seed. If the seed itself is inedible, and the best example is liftit, <laughs> which is where the canola oil, canola oil comes from. By the way, I just discovered this year, I investigated a little bit what the canola oil consists of and how it's made. I discovered this year something very cool. Um, in 1968, 1968, quite recently, they first discovered how to make reasonable tasting and good tasting canola oil. It wasn't a product that they used until 1968. There was an oil that they, that they derived from liftit. Liftit is the seed, the rape seed, it's called. The rape seed is what it's made of, black. which is black, inedible. You can't eat that seed at all. You can only derive oil. But when they used to do it 100, 200 years ago, it used to come out very bitter and sometimes poisonous. It wasn't, they only used it as an oil for machines. It was machine oil that they made out of rape seed. It was machine oil. Only in 1968 in Canada, some uh, scientists were able to combine different rape seeds of different types and, and, and mix the oil out of all of them together and they became canola oil, which is very reasonable and tasty and good to use. Not sure health-wise, but that's something else. Uh, from the point of view of edible. And why is it called canola? That was the, key, that was the cool thing I found out because it used to be much longer. Canadian oil. That used to be the name, Canadian oil. And they made it in short form, canola oil. It's a Canadian oil. They made it in short form of that. That's, that's where it comes from. That's the name, canola. Anyway, so, <coughs> so that, there are so many reasons, so many reasons to allow a, a, such, a, such a product, uh, even for those who don't eat kidney oil. So therefore, Rabbi Yaakov Ariel came out with a, strong sock that it's allowed. And uh, although in our home, we don't use it because uh, my yeah, wife won't accept, but, uh, <laughs> but from my point of view, I don't do the cooking, so I can't, uh, I can't mix into the kitchen, but uh, I think it can be used definitely. They're oh, very, we're not gonna oh, go. Ran from, from, from many years ago. ago. Okay, okay. No, there is another new one. I'll tell you one more new one. 
right, 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 right. But I'll tell you something that we heard then as well, but maybe not. So I'll say my wife, oh, my wife doesn't. Right, my wife doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, but it's okay to use. It's definitely okay to use. Uh, the the uh, the other great leniency that he discussed in that same shear we were, for those who haven't heard about it yet, is that when something is mixed with kitniot that are not visible, you can't see the kitniot. It's just absorbed in. For example, even if you had a chulent made with Rice, it has rice included, or beans, or beans included, right? Or Rebecca Real says this that even though it's absorbed with the taste of kitniot, you can pick out the meat, pick out the, the tomatoes, the potatoes, and eat them, even though it's cooked with kitniot, yes, and beans and everything. So you don't touch the rice, you don't touch the beans, or eat everything else. And he says that he himself does so. Rakhavid says he himself does so because he has son-in-laws that are Sfaradi, and they in their home have kitniot. So when, his, when he is invited to their home, he eats everything unless he sees the kitniot itself. That's all. The only thing he doesn't he eat. You can eat it, that's what he means. Yes. That's a big one. So that's a big one. Happen, that's a very big one. Right. Right. So, so what's the answer for that? Right, that it's absorbed in. Um, well, he's not saying to cook he's it. Saying, yeah. He's saying if you happen to have it. So he's saying yeah. if you're saying if you're in your house, 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 um, I remember he said that, he said that, or he said that it, it was cooked with rice, so you have the water, the water that, of the soup you can eat. Yeah, even that, even that, yeah, I remember also something like that. Right. Right. So, uh, right. Now, I, I remember why. I just remembered why. His, his daughters, not his grandchildren, his daughters. His daughters, right? Yeah. Right. <coughs> no, so I'll tell you what the difference is. Or ask. Right, so all right, all right, that's a good question. It's going that all commercial products could also be eaten by Ashkenazi that are mixed in with kitniot. We can't see them anymore. So the reason it's all allowed is because kitniot is battle barov. It's enough that there is a majority. You don't need even 60 times of the kitniot. Enough rov, and it's battle, and it's allowed already. So unless you see it, the moment you see the kitniot, then it's not battle, even times 2,000. If you see something that's not allowed to be eaten, doesn't matter how much it's mixed with other foods, it's not allowed. But one thing cannot be done, and that is bitul isur lechatchila. We can't take a, a kitnia product, a kitnia, and deliberately mix it into our food and nullify it within Rome. That's called bitul isur lechatchila. If it was done already, then we can eat it. And the person who did it did it because they're allowed to. As far as person can include kitniot in their foods with no problem. We go now to their home. If we're not eating the kitniot itself, only the stuff that was mixed with the kitniot or grinded in a way that you can't see it anymore, so it's batil barov. And if batil barov, you're allowed to eat it. And you didn't do it intentionally to nullify it because it wasn't done by you. It was done by the Sephardic. was allowed to. Now, commercially, when it's done by, by factories that include kitniot, so if we would take, if we would consume as Ashkenazi, that would mean that they're making it for us, which would mean that's the only issue. Now that it's done, we really could eat it. It's not a real problem to eat it. But if we start buying such products, then they would start manufacturing for Ashkenazim as well. Now they know that their customers are only Sephardim in the, in the country. So they know they make a certain amount that's enough for all the Sephardim. If we would start buying it as a Shkenazim, they would make more. And then 
they're doing it for us. They're being mevatel isu lechatchila for for us, which we cannot do to begin with. So that's the only reason we can't buy. Right, they weren't in the days of the. Right. <laughs> that's a Rosh Feinstein's idea that if it wasn't uh, available in those days, a type of kidney that we discovered more recently, not 700 years ago, the, the whole issue of kidney began. To, that's the quinoa, that's the peanuts. The peanuts. No, canola oil has a different reason totally. No, I know, but it fits into that also. It fits also, right. No, but canola has I many, many. Right. It doesn't it doesn't meet any criteria, any but any of them. But but the peanuts, for example, that was that was the Ramosha finds his discussion. He said we can eat peanuts because they weren't available, they weren't known to the world 700 years ago. The Bamba went to Ramosha Feinstein, every Ashkenazi can eat Bamba. But no one does because we don't some no, examine didn't he said, then best not to, right? <laughs> right, so better not to. Right. Right. Rosh Hashanah in general. Right. Rosh Hashanah in general disagreed with the whole concept. He said it doesn't matter if it was available then or not. It's the same essence as the kitniot of those days. So even if we discover new ones, they're all included. That's Rosh Hashanah. That's the stringency that I was going to say that he includes kinua and everything. Going to Rosh Hashanah and all that too because it's a kitniot. I don't know specifically kinua, but all those types of new findings were there. I don't know. He, he passed away 27 years ago. I had to find out no, if there was Kinua 27 years ago. 27 years ago? I don't know. Uh -huh. How long ago was this? How long ago? Uh -huh. Yes, I remember being away. I had never seen it before. Uh -huh. Maybe we had but that long ago? That long ago? No, right. But Hashem Zaman says that the, the essence of it was what they told us to refrain from, not the actual specific kitniot that were available then. That's how he, that's how he felt. No, he, he did, but uh, no, it says in the book at least. I don't know, I've never been in, I've been in his home to see what he ate, but it says in the book that he thought he, he didn't find, he couldn't find a good reason why that should not be also a kitnia. No, it's very large and everything. He, he, he definitely preferred that people should not make cakes from potato starch that look like chametz. He said the whole idea of kitniot is not to mix up between the kitniot and the wheat. That's the whole idea of not to eat kitniot. And what do we do today? We do everything, like everything looking like chametz. We have kadeh marak, we have noodles, we have cakes, we have, we have rolls, we have rolls, we have rolls, everything. So pizzas and everything. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he says that's, that's contradicting the whole concept of um, uh, we try not to make them, but uh, some of the things the kids really, really want to have, like, they can't without. Yeah, so. Yeah, sometimes the cakes look like Pesach cakes, you know, you can tell the difference. They're sunk a little bit and uh, very airy, and you can tell the difference. But try not to make some, they make wafers today. They mamish look like a wafer. <laughs> so you can buy them a Pesach and eat them after. Yeah. Yeah, the macaroons are fine because they're really Pesach. Uh, that's Pesach, right. Okay. Um, very lastly, whoever wants to continue uh, listening, just a few more, a very, uh, a very quickly. Uh, points for Leila Seder, just very, very quickly. Um, Shlomo Zaman held that grape juice is as good as wine completely. You don't need to even try to attempt to have four cups of wine. He did 
he did uh, say that it's best if you combine some wine with the grape juice. Just a little bit, because of a more emuna philosophical type idea, not the halacha. Halacha completely accepted, unlike Moshe Feinstein, who uh, demanded that you have wine. Uh, Ramosha Fine said you must have wine, even if you have a headache afterwards and everything. But uh, Shlomo Zalman said it's not true. It's enough to have grape juice. Yes, it, it has to be red. Specifically on Pesach, it has to be red. All the, other, the rest of the year for Kiddush or Abdullah, doesn't matter, red or white. But for specifically Pesach, it has to be red because it also resembles the blood and, and things of that sort. Uh, generally, we hold that white wine is as as important as red, except for the Ramban. But, yes, but better if you do the opposite. You first, first pour the grape juice, red, red stuff first, and on top of it, pour the white, because then you're not coloring it. It gets colored on its own and by itself. You're not adding color to it. That's called Sibiyah Be'ochin. We don't hold it to Sibiyah Be'ochin, but better, better yet if you do it the other way around. But yes, you can dye the uh, white wine with some red uh, grape juice or wine. Okay. Um, another part, another uh, issue about Leila uh, Seder. Uh, uh, when we say the Shechianu, it's nice to announce before Kiddush that anyone should know, everyone should know on the table that when we're going to say the Shechianu, we're including all the, first of all, the fact that it's the new Yom Tov that came in, the Shechianu over the day, Bazman Azeh. And including all the new mitzvahs, the one time, one night mitzvah, the mitzvahs that we're going to do, which are many, many, many. The right time, there are yeah, yeah. Right, the same idea of candles. So, women who are very, very uh, uh, accustomed to saying Shekhyan over the candle lighting, we won't take it away from them. But, uh, but it's really not necessary because they're, do, because they're going to be hearing the Shekhyan over Kiddush. If they do say it because they feel I that's their custom, um, you don't need to do that. No, you don't need to because it's a real Shekhyan over the day. But there's a whole discussion. Should, should they be answering Amen to the Shekhyan being said at Kiddush Shalena Seder because they made it already. So for them, it's like an unnecessary bracha. So it's a hefsek between the drinking, uh, the bracha of Bari Pergafi and the drinking. Mishlom Azamin said in the end that they can answer Amin. They're allowed to answer Amin, even if you've said it already over your candle lighting, because it's still part of the Kiddush. It's not an interruption. It's still words that are being said uh, within the Kiddush. <coughs> okay. Um, um, there's a whole long discussion. We'll get into it about how come we have such a long interruption between Kiddush and the eating. Two hours later, we start eating the Suda. How can that be? These are to have Kiddushim Kom Suda. They have to be very close to each other. Make Kiddush, and you start your meal. Here, you're having such a long interruption. It's all considered preparation for the meal from the beginning. I'll we'll go into that. And how can we don't say a bracha chrona over the first cup that we drank? Because we're not going to have food till two hours later. So we're missing the bracha chrona. Why not? Okay, all kinds of uh, discussions we won't get into. Um, about yes. In theory, you say the bracha candles and then light it. Correct, because it's young tov. You can light it. You still have to let it be up. No, of course. No, that, even though it's Friday, Friday night. No, it's Friday. Friday night you let it and then you say the bracha. Right. Wait, Friday. You know about young tov with Sean? It's Shabbos, right. That's a regular day of Shabbos. So, so you're talking about Yom Tov Shabbos. 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 Shabb
Right, Eruv Tavshirim for the last uh, last day. Right, right. Okay, so I guess uh, we'll stop at this. There's a lot more to discuss, but uh, uh, that's how we accomplished. So have a, I'll just finish the Zoom. Have a Chag Sameach and a uh, happy time with your families, with all of Am Yisrael, and we hope to see you in Beit HaMikdash, everyone. Zat Hashem, we give you a last Shlema before, before Chag already. Okay, call to Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Okay, gladly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.